Hello, I'm Susan Marvin, and we're very pleased to have you with us today. I'm Susan Marvin, the director of the Dispute Resolution Center, and Kimberly Kosh is our co-presenter today. She is the Dispute Resolution Center Senior Court Operations Consultant, and today we are doing a training on mediator ethics. It's complicated. And we're going to talk about the rules of procedure, the state court rules of procedure relevant to mediation. Just wanna let you know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Florida Courts YouTube channel after uh, we record it. Please put your questions in the chat box with your name and we will answer them either during the presentation if time allows or by email after the presentation so that all of your questions may get answered. When you registered to attend today, you should have received the materials via email. If you did not, please put your email in the chat and we will send the materials to you. The materials you were sent contain the certificate of attendance, which lists the CME credits, the Florida Bar CLE information, if you are going to use your attendance for CLE. Again, I'm Susan Marvin with the Dispute Resolution Center and Kimberly Kosh is joining me and Kimberly Kosh is going to begin our presentation. Okay, thank you, Susan, for that warm introduction. And um, I just like to remind you that the course is approved for CLE credit and that information is on the screen as well as our general um, address. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with our presentation today. And what we are going to do is we're going to look at our rules of procedure. So there are five areas of rules of procedure for court connected mediations. And these rules complement our state statutes, our ethical procedures, uh, administrative orders, and other authorities that govern mediation. So um, many of us, um, when we are looking at a full complement of rules, we'll need to look at these rules and or if we have any questions that pertain to the mechanics and the procedures of court connected mediations. And I do want to point out that these rules of procedures and the items that we're going to go over today only pertain to the mediations that are referred by the court or the parties have opted into um, uh, proceeding along with these procedures. If you mediate cases in other agencies or other venues, you would need to look to um, their authorities for areas that um, govern procedures. So the first one that we're gonna look at today is the small claims rules. And part of the materials that you received has the mediator's almanac. And uh, more importantly than referring to it uh, today while we're speaking is actually the resource that it may provide for you um, in the future. It contains selected rules of procedure and part two of the ethical standards for mediators and sections of chapter 44 that deal with mediation confidentiality and privilege. And those are the authorities that we get the most questions on. So hence we have this available for you and you can also find it on the DRC's website. So if we look at um, in the areas that we're gonna look at today in terms of the rules of procedures have a singular focus, I'll be speaking about appearance and authority um, and Susan will be talking about areas of agreement or no agreement. So we'll be looking at those three specific areas across the five procedural rules. And uh, the first one that I'm gonna look at is the Florida Small Claims Rule. And if you are familiar with Small Claims Court, you know that the mediation procedures are somewhat relaxed. Um, a lawyer or a non-lawyer representative may appear on behalf of a party without the party uh, being present, as long as those individuals have 
uh, full authority to appear without further consultation. Uh, mediation generally um, takes place at pretrial and appearance is not defined more than um, you're required to be there. So it's a fairly simple and straightforward rule. And we know that the small claims jurisdiction recently was raised from $5,000 to $8,000. And if you're a county mediator, you may also mediate in the area of county court above small claims. And that area of jurisdiction likewise was recently amended. And the county court jurisdiction went from $15,000 to $30,000 last year and in 2020 is subject to another increase to $50,000. And effective January 1 of 2021, um, appellate actions from the county court will now be heard by the district courts of appeals rather than the trial court uh, circuit courts. So um, we've got some um, action and some changes in county court actions. Um, the rules of procedure state that um, in county court actions basically repeat the appearance requirements and the authority requirements that we find in small claims. And if the um, action is a county court action, then the parties are deemed to appear if the persons in Rule 1.720B are physically present. And we see this for the first time actually saying physically present rather than just appearance in the rule. And rule 1.720B happens to be the same rule that governs circuit civil actions. So depending on what area you're mediating in, you may see differences and you will see differences in the requirements for appearance um, and some are more detailed than others. But if you're mediating a case that falls under the circuit jurisdiction, you actually have requirements for up to three persons um, being physically present at the mediation, the party or its representative having full authority to settle, the party's counsel of record, if any, and an insurance representative from the insurance carrier if there is insurance involved, and that person um, has to have full authority to settle up to the amount of the plaintiff's last demand or policy limits, whichever is less without further consultation. So we see just a little bit of a different appearance requirement um, and authority for um, representatives of insurance carriers. If you look further down for civil actions, you find a definition for party representative having full authority to settle. Um, neither uh, the small claims rule or the county action rule that we just looked at has um, a definition for what a party having full authority to settle means. So here, um, it, we have a definition and what is compelling is that the person has the ability to execute a binding settlement agreement on behalf of the party. There's also st a statement that says that, um, that nothing in this rule shall require anyone who appears at a conference to enter into a settlement agreement um, and a restatement of what I think of as the party self-determination to agree or not to agree. In addition, there's also a subsection on appearance by a public entity. And appearance for that type of participant is also slightly different because the representative for a public entity only has to have full authority to negotiate on behalf of the entity and to recommend settlement to the appropriate decision-making decision body. So it is contemplated, you might assume from this rule, that when persons from public entities participate, that agreements might not be able to be signed um, at, the, at the conference uh, proper, but rather after approval from another um, authority source. 
Okay, in the civil rules of procedure, we also find that if a party uh, representative is attending, that representative has an obligation 10 days before the conference to provide the court and all the parties with a written notice identifying the person or persons who will be attending the mediation conference and who has authority to negotiate on behalf of um, that party or that participant. Um, the rule also lays out sanctions for failure to appear. Um, we didn't see that in the small claims rule. So um, this is the first civil area where we see that there's actually uh, sanctions if the parties don't um, appear and the court can do that on its own motion or on uh, the request of another party. Um, moving on from uh, civil cases to dependency mediations. And I know that um, this is the area where we have um, the smallest grouping of mediators and mediations going on through uh, state trial court mediation programs. But it's um, of particular note that this is um, in their rules of procedure, they actually have a provision for naming or prohibiting the attendance of the parties. Um, in the civil rules, um, there is a stipulation that the parties can agree to attendance. Um, here in the dependency rules, we see more court regulation of who can attend and what type of authority that they have to come to the session with. So um, here you see that the section um, laid out in terms of appearances actually mentions the physical presence of adult parties and participants. And um, many of us know during this time of COVID that the Chief Justice in concert with the trial court chief judges um, have permission to relax uh, procedural rules which require the physical attendance of party except in specified cases. So where there is requirements for physical appearance in um, court connected mediations, um, those, uh, those actions by um, our court leaders have allowed us to move on into the adult world. Um, I'm sorry, not adult world, remote world. Um, Persons uh, representing um, an agency, in this case, um, in order to have full settlement authority, they are expected to be able to enter into an agreement. Unlike the provision that we had in the circuit civil rules that required anyone from a public agency to be able to recommend settlement um, in dependency mediations, that participant actually has to be able to bind an agreement. Dependency rules also talk about appearance of counsel, like some of the other rules do. Um, but, but dependency mediation is unique in that it has a section on the appearance of a child. And specifically that the court can prohibit a child from appearing at mediation and that no minor child shall be required to appear unless the court has previously determined by written order that it is in the child's best interest to be physically present. Um, so there are um, some strict guidelines set for participations of minors in mediation in this context. Um, we also see that um, there are sanctions for failure to appear. So um, again, someone could um, have a number of different items levied against them if the court found that the person uh, did, not, did not appear without good cause. Um, moving on to the uh, appellate mediation rules. And um, along with dependency, this is an area where we have a, a smaller caseload compared to the circuit or um, the, the family um, arena, but um, you will find that the appellate rules for appearance and authority are very similar to the circuit civil rules of procedure. So we see here for um, appearance that uh, the same provisions for a public entity apply um, that we saw in circuit mediation. 
Um, these are also the parties who must attend the mediation. And what's interesting about this under sub two is that there's a specific reference that the party's trial or appellate counsel of record, if any, must be in attendance. And if the party has more than one counsel, the appearance of only one counsel is required. And none of the other rules contemplate or have provisions about appearance of more than one counsel. Um, and I think that that is unique to the area of appellate and the fact that um, many uh, parties and participants may be represented by different counsel at those different stages of the court. Um, the sanctions for failure to appear at appellate mediation include most of the same sanctions that you'll find in the other areas. However, this area is a little bit more developed in that it also includes the striking of briefs, the elimination of oral argument, or the dismissal or summary affirmants, which are fairly um, um, important um, items to have if you are um, part of an appellate case. So this is a very high level sanction that the court can impose upon you in that area. Um, here we see again that they define um, a full party having full authority to settle in the same manner as circuit civil. The same certificate of, of um, authority is required if a party representative is attending an appellate mediation. And uh, moving on, I know rather quickly, but on to uh, family mediation. When we look at family mediations, this is one of the um, only areas where we don't see uh, references to party representatives having full authority to settle. Um, in family mediation, a party is deemed to uh, appear if that person is physically present. Um, and interestingly enough, with the discretion of the mediator and with the agreement of the parties, family mediation may proceed in the absence of counsel unless otherwise ordered by the court. And I said interestingly enough, because if you've been uh, reading uh, many of these slides, you will see that oftentimes, um, uh, and just like this provision does, it says unless otherwise stipulated by the parties or perhaps the parties or the court, um, this is one of the first areas where we see the mediator being actively involved in this decision of um, when to move forward um, when counsel is not available. So in family, there's also sanctions, but you'll see here it's sanctions generally. It does mention if a party fails to appear that um, the court can impose sanctions. But what is unique to this rule, and I haven't found it as a reference in any of the other rules that we've looked at, is that this rule also contains a provision for sanctions to be applied for knowingly and willfully violating any confidentiality provision under section 44405 Florida statutes. So um, this is fairly strong language. The court here gives a shout out to the importance of maintaining confidentiality of um, mediation sessions. Um, I've wrapped up my rather quick review of the procedural rules with a focus on appearance and authority. And I have a few MEAC opinions uh, to go over with you before handing uh, the microphone over to Susan. So in your materials, you have several pages of MEAC opinions on the topics of appearance, authority, and agreements. Um, we have selected just a few of those to go over in the presentation, so we encourage you to look at the handouts for additional information and guidance in this area. Um, but one of the uh, per, uh, questions that we have, uh, the MEAC, the Mediator Ethics Advisory Committee, has received, and this is not the first time this type of question has been asked, but it talks about whether or not the mediator can unilaterally set a date for mediation. 
And the uh, importance there is, is once that date is set, that there can be sanctions for failure to appear. So mutual agreement of the date and uh, the requirements of attendance seem to be um, likely in an area that promotes self-determination. And the MEAC opined that a mediator was able to unilaterally set the date but the mediator had to be open to resetting the dates to accommodate the parties in the time frame ordered by the court. Um, so for practice purposes, you can move along with setting those dates, um, but be reopened to rescheduling is the advice from the MEAC. Um, this this uh, next MEAC opinion, 2015-002, uh, the questioner asked whether there is a requirement or whether they could voluntarily identify the parties and the participants who appeared for mediation. And the MEAC opined that there is no local, unless there is a local court rule, court rule or administrative order requiring the mediator to identify those parties and participants, the mediator can, but is not required to do so. So um, I would imagine that of the 20 circuits we have represented here today and uh, quite a few participants that you have varying practices on whether or not you report who appeared at a mediation. Um, but again, unless you have a, a local court uh, rule that um, prevails, this is an option for the mediator. MEAC opinion 2007-001, uh, going back now about 13 years, um, codifies that the mediator may report a party's failure to appear at a mediation as long as it's based on a physical fact and not a mediation communication or assertion. And uh, the, the MEAC was very keen in um, including the fact that um, the comments cannot be based on a mediation communication because there is no exception to confidentiality for communications representing a lack of settlement authority or for a party's failure to appear. And the last MEAC opinion I'm going to cover is um, has uh, just hit its 20 year anniversary. And um, it, this opinion um, states that pursuant to rules, the reason for cancellation or postponement should not be explained in the mediator's report. So um, if uh, the parties have um, not conducted a mediation, you can report that a mediation has not been conducted. You can report that a mediation session that's going to be adjourned and continued for another time, you can report that, um, but you should not be reporting that it was canceled or making any other commentary that the parties have not agreed to. So um, that is uh, my portion of the presentation. And Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you to cover the areas of uh, area of agreements. Thank you, Kimberly. I have been busily sending people the materials. Uh, hopefully everyone has gotten them. All right, so um, I am going to talk about how the rules of procedure uh, relate to the um, agreements, uh, reports and agreements. And we are, as you can see on the slide, we are starting with small claims and county court, uh, the Florida small claims rule, uh, as far as agreements, just says that the agreement is written in the form of a stipulation. And if you volunteer for a trial court ADR program in the small claims arena, uh, you are probably being supplied with their stipulation form and instructions on how to proceed with that. There is no reference in the small claims rule about submitting a report to the court about uh, whether or not there is an agreement or no agreement. It's just about submitting uh, a stipulation form. 
So that's a little different than some of the other rules of procedure. For county above small claims, um, as you can see, uh, the small claims is also mentioned in the county court rule, rule of civil procedure 1.750 subsection F. Uh, that, that subsection also talks about small claims, but if you happen to mediate above small claims, which as Kimberly mentioned, the jurisdiction level would be above $8,000 claimed, then you will be following the rules of civil procedure, just like a, a higher uh, civil court case. So uh, Kimberly, if you'd like to go to the next slide, thank you. Um, for other uh, or higher level civil court cases, we have rule uh, 1.730, completion of mediation for the circuit level, which would be above uh, $30,000 or county cases, you know, above $8,000. If there um, is no agreement, then you follow a subsection A and report that. Um, this subsection also says, and we're gonna talk more about this later, but uh, you need to read that second sentence. With the consent of the parties, the mediator's report may also identify any pending motions or outstanding legal issues, discovery process or other action by any party, which if resolved or completed would facilitate the possibility of a settlement. So uh, keep that uh, sentence and this uh, identification of a resource to go back to in your mind. Um, you have to have the party's consent to add anything um, other than agreement, no agreement, or partial agreement to a mediator's report. And we'll talk again, we'll talk about that in more in depth in a minute. So uh, that's rule some uh, 1.730A. If you would move to B, please, uh, Kimberly. Thank you. And um, B talks more about the agreement than the report. This uh, part of the rule says that the agreement shall be filed when required by law or with the party's consent. Um, and this is just a recognition that with higher civil cases, um, the agreement isn't required um, to be filed in every case as it might be in another case type. That's why you have to pay attention to what case type you are in and the appropriate rule that applies to it. So if you're in a higher level civil case, then uh, you only file the agreement if the law requires it or with the party's consent. Sometimes in circuit level civil cases, the parties want their agreement to be confidential and not filed with the court. And you as the mediator need to pay attention to uh, what the parties and their attorneys want to do in the higher level cases. So some of those agreements may be confidential. And um, yes, moving to dependency. Um, these are the rules of juvenile procedure as far as agreements and reports. Um, if the agreement is reached, um, it needs to be reduced to writing, signed by the parties, and submitted to the court by the mediator. And of course, um, this may be, I don't remember this in the other rules, uh, copies to all of the parties in the council. That's, um, of course, something you would do. If they don't reach an agreement, then you would just report the lack of agreement without comment or recommendation. Um, so keep that in mind that um, most of the rules say that you would file a report without comment or uh, recommendation. Go ahead and go to the next one, please. Um, Kimberly, thank you. Um, in independency, uh, the court holds a hearing and enters an order accepting or rejecting, rejecting the agreement consistent with the best interests of the child. 
course, dependency is a different animal um, than many other case types. And the court has an obligation to determine whether the agreement is in the best interest of the child. So the court could actually modify the terms of the agreement with the consent of all parties to the agreement at this hearing on the mediated agreement. That's pretty unusual. So pay attention to the dependency rules if you are mediating a dependency case. Next slide. And um, of course, as Kimberly mentioned, there are rules of procedure regarding mediation that have sanctions and um, dependency is no exception to that. Uh, you could have sanctions imposed against you if you breach or fail to per perform under the court approved agreement. Next slide. All right, and then we move to appellate mediation. The, um, the rule has a provision that if the parties do not reach an agreement, the mediator must report that within 10 days uh, without comment or recommendation. You'll keep seeing that familiar language and um, that's something we need to pay attention to as mediators be, and that's due to the confidentiality of mediation. Uh, the subsection B says, of course, if you reach an agreement, partial or final, um, it would be put in writing, signed by the parties or their counsel. We're going to talk about a MEAC opinion in a minute about signing agreements. And um, the mediator, again, within 10 days, needs to file a report to the court on a form approved by the court. Next slide. And then uh, we have family mediation, uh, same kind of provisions. If an agreement is reached as to any matter or issue, you would put that in an agreement in writing signed by the parties or their counsel. And uh, you'll notice it's not required that the mediator sign the agreement, but the parties and their counsel are required to sign it. Uh, submitted to the court unless the parties agree otherwise. So um, the reports and agreements, well, agreements, I'm sorry, not re reports, you're always going to file agreements, you would file with the court unless the parties um, agree to something else. Um, you could have the agreement electronically or stenographically recorded and made under oath or affirmed. I don't think that happens very often. I did uh, family law mediations for a court program for many years and we never, I never saw a mediation in which the agreement was electronically or stenographically recorded, but it could be done. Uh, if you did that, you would have to have a signed transcript that would be filed by the court. So, um, Sometimes in family law agreements, the court needs to determine if the agreement is appropriate. And hence you have subsection two, um, the court would take any action that's required by law. If court approval is not necessary, it would become binding upon filing. When court approval is necessary, uh, it's binding upon approval of the court and uh, the agreement is made part of the final judgment or order in the case. I believe uh, that usually the court wants to review and approve agreements involving children. So again, the best interest of the children uh, is going to be important to the court. Next slide. Uh, rule 12.741, family law mediation. If the parties don't reach an agreement, uh, the mediator would just report lack of agreement without comment or recommendation. That phrase should become familiar to you. Without comment or recommendation, as tempting as it is for us to put something in that report, we need to refrain. With the cons However, in uh, family law, and I uh, believe in uh, civil cases too, with the consent of the parties, the mediators may report 
uh, the mediator's report may identify any pending motion or outstanding legal issues, discovery process, or other action by any party, which if resolved or completed would facilitate the possibility of a settlement. So uh, notice that phrase, with consent of the parties. So it's not up to the mediator to put confidential information in the report. You have to have the party's consent. And we're going to talk about that in some MEAC opinions. Next slide. All right. Uh, since I re keep referring to MEAC opinions, let's dig into those. MEAC 2017-006 is about reports. And, um, you know, it's uh, not unusual for mediators to uh, be tempted to put confidential information in reports. So in this MEAC opinion, uh, the MEAC reviewed previous MEAC opinions and did an analysis of the various rules of procedure, just like you're doing today, regarding reporting the outcome of a mediation. And the MEAC retracted MEAC 2014-002, which only permitted the reporting of agreement or no agreement. It didn't permit partial agreement. So it retracted, the MEAC in 2017 retracted the 2014 opinion and any other opinion inconsistent with the 2017 opinion. The committee interpreted the rules of procedure that we've been looking at to allow a mediator to report agreement no agreement or partial agreement to the court without comment or recommendation. To report anything additional without the agreement of the parties or add descriptors or modifiers to agreement, no agreement or partial agreement would be providing information to the court or action on an action uh, which is prohibited by the Mediation Confidentiality and Privilege Act sections 44.401 to uh, 405, Florida statutes. However, as I've been pointing out to you, the rules do not restrict the parties from including in the written agreement their consent to the inclusion of additional language descriptors or modifiers in the mediator's report. So if I was doing a mediation and I, um, the parties wanted me to include something, uh, a descriptor in their mediation report. What I want to do is have them put that agreement uh, and consent in their actual mediation agreement. It should, you know, you would just have a paragraph that says, uh, we hereby agree to including a description of blank, blank, blank in the mediator's report. Further, uh, the MEAC said, as is stated in the Rule of Civil Procedure 1.730A and Family Law Rule of Procedure 12.740, uh, I believe it's F3, in civil and family law cases only with, as I mentioned before, with the consent of the parties. The mediator's report may also identify any pending motions or outstanding legal issues discovery process or other action by any party, which if resolved or completed would facilitate the possibility of a settlement. So just make sure you have the consent of the parties if you want to include anything in the mediator's report that uh, other than agreement, no agreement or partial agreement. In your materials, um, not in a slide, so I'm not going to advance the slides yet, we have a uh, included in your materials. You might want to look at MEAC 2020-002. That's a very long opinion that offers additional information about reports to the court. So if you have more questions, you might find an answer there. Also on that topic is MEAC 2019-005, and we don't have a slide for that one. It's in your materials, the summary. That has to do with not including mediation communications in the mediator's report. And uh, remember, you can always find the full MEAC opinions on the FL Courts website under uh, the Dispute Resolution Center. 
Moving to the next slide, please. We have MEAC 2015-005. And this one is um, a, a question in which a mediator asked about their ethical obligation under rule 10.420 subsection C of the rules for certified and court appointed mediators. And as you may recall, that rule reads, the mediator shall cause the terms of any agreement reached to be memorialized appropriately and discuss with the parties and counsel the process for formalization and implementation of the agreement. So in this question, the mediator's situation was that they mediated a case in which the parties reached a full agreement. The plaintiff's attorney offered to draft the agreement and send it to all parties for review and execution. And all parties verbally agreed to the attorney drafting the agreement. Everybody agreed to it. And um, just as a little aside here before I go on with uh, the opinion, in your mediation practice, you may have had several or many mediations in which the attorneys and the parties agreed that one of the attorneys was gonna draft the agreement. It's not an unusual occurrence in certainly in family law and county or circuit level civil cases in which the parties are represented by attorneys for one of the attorneys to offer to draft the agreement and everybody says we're fine with that. Sometimes uh, you may have even seen attorneys bring a draft agreement on an electronic device to a mediation. Maybe they have a template or something they've been working on and they modify it at the mediation to fit whatever is agreed to at the mediation. They just fine tune it. And of course, again, everybody has to agree to the provisions in the agreement before they sign it. Or they might draft the agreement at the mediation. Uh, now that we're so electronic, um, people bring devices and they can draft the agreement at the mediation. Um, many uh, video conferencing mediations now um, have screen sharing and the parties and their attorneys work on the agreements uh, even on a video conference mediation. Going back to the MEAC opinion, 2015-005, the MEAC stated the verbal discussion in the scenario presented satisfies the requirements of rule 10.420C. If you carefully read that rule, it does not require the mediator to write something regarding the terms of the agreement prior to the close of mediation uh, or the mediation session, if the parties have agreed on who will memorialize the agreement and the process for its formalization. You just, as a mediator, need to encourage them to have that discussion before they leave. The committee note to rule 10.420 confirms this, that uh, the mediator doesn't have to write something by advising in that committee note, mediators have an obligation to ensure these rules, the Florida Rule of Civil Procedure 1.730B, Florida Rule of Juvenile Procedure 8.290 small zero, and Florida Family Law Rule of Procedure 12.740F, are complied with, but are not required to write the agreement themselves. Florida Rule of Appellate Procedure 9.740, Completion of Mediation, Sub B, Agreement, adopted in 2010, is similar to the other rules of procedure. All right, uh, could we have the next one, please? MEAC 2013-007. In this opinion, the inquirer asked several questions regarding a family law mediation in which the mother had an attorney and the father did not. Uh, you may have that sometimes too, either two self-represented or pro se uh, parties, and, or you know one of the parties is represented and the other is not. The parties uh, written and signed mediation agreements stated, this, uh, this provision. 
the husband represented at mediation that he only has two bank accounts. He shall provide all monthly statements from 2011, 2012, and 2013 for, and they put in the bank account name or the bank name and um, another bank name account within 21 days. That's what the mediated settlement agreement said. The MEAC stated, Unless the parties have agreed otherwise, written communications included in a mediated agreement that has been signed by all parties and counsel are not confidential. So the question was, you know, is part of this agreement confidential? And there were a series of questions if you want to look at that opinion. And MIAC said, uh, unless they've agreed otherwise, the written communications in a signed agreement are not confidential. And of course, the authority for that is section 44.405, 4A, Florida statutes, which says there is no confidentiality or privilege attached to a signed written agreement reached during a mediation unless the parties agree otherwise. So again, you know, in a higher circuit uh, civil case, the parties might agree that they want the um, mediation agreement kept confidential. And if they put that in the agreement, uh, then they don't have to file it and it would be confidential. And uh, the last MEAC opinion for today is 2011-001 and Oldie Goldie in which a circuit mediator said they had several discussions with similar mediators about whether the mediator should sign the settlement agreement at mediation or only counsel and the parties should sign. And remember when we were reading through the slides with the various rules of procedure, some of them said, um, you know, signed by the parties and their counsel. MEAC stated it is neither a requirement nor a violation of the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure or the rules for certified and court appointed mediators for a certified mediator to sign a written settlement agreement in the capacity of mediator. Specifically, Rule 1.730B, Rules of Civil Procedure, states in part if a partial or final agreement is reached, it shall be reduced to writing and signed by the parties and their counsel, if any. So you notice that when we quote that rule, it does not say anything about the mediator signing. It's not required that the mediator sign. In addition, the MEAC went on, the appellate small claims, county, family, and juvenile procedural rules governing court referred, court referred mediations do not require or prohibit a certified mediator from signing written settlement agreements. So there's no requirement that a mediator sign and there's no prohibition. And um, that MEAC opinion cites all of the various rules of procedure <clears throat> from which they made that statement. They also included, uh, since many of you may mediate in small claims and county courts, um, that throughout Florida, those courts have local procedures requiring the mediator to sign any written agreement reached between the parties. This practice is not prohibited by procedural or ethical rules, but a mediator should ensure that their signature signifies nothing more than that they medi mediated the case. In so doing, a certified mediator would be in compliance with local rules, procedures, and orders pursuant to rule 10.520 of the Florida rules for certified and court appointed mediators. So you always wanna check um, with some of those optional procedures at what your local, uh, your local circuit requires or um, advises you to do. And Kimberly, that is my discussion of agreements uh, and the MEAC opinions. You are uh, good. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you, Susan. And um, our the the last closing slide that we have for you is a reminder that in your materials we have provided you um, with a cheat sheet, and this 
is a quick snapshot of uh, just part of it. Um, and what we have done is um, for both appearance authority and then um, in a subsection on its own same page for agreements, we have cross compared a number of different items um, across the procedural rules that we've discussed today. So you'll see, uh, for example, um, the, the first line, the first column on our cheat sheet is party not required to appear. Um, and you will see that that is true in small claims. And if the parties in the mediator agree, it's also true um, in dependency. So we have a number of different areas for you. Um, we hope that you find this a handy cheat sheet. We have seen a number of your comments and emails that you did not receive the materials. And like Susan said before she began her presentation, she had sent those to a number of you. For those of you who are contacting me through email, um, we will get them to you um, soon um, or um, uh, first thing uh, as, uh, in the new week. So um, Susan, if you're ready, um, we'll take on some questions. Uh, but before we get uh, to do that, I'd like to remind everybody that our next and final ethics presentation in our fall series um, is scheduled for Friday, January 29th. Um, we are also discussing a mediator ethics topic, and we will be focusing on the best of MEAC, um, and that will be uh, 12 noon. That information and reminder is also on your handouts. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the questions. And Susan, um, if you don't mind, um, I'll throw some at you and um, we'll get some feedback. If we don't have time to answer your question, like Susan said earlier, we will outreach to you in the next several days and try to assist you um, with your, your questions. So, um, Let's see, it says, uh, all right, let's go. Uh, this one looks a little meaty. It says a public company will not grant open-ended authority to settle a multi-million dollar case. Typically in other states, the system sort of ignores this problem. Do you have any comments in Florida? Well, and Kimberly, I, um, I'm happy to have you uh, put in your wisdom on that. Uh, I don't, see why you couldn't ignore that too. I'm sorry, what the, and I read that question. What's the first part? Others? The public company will not use grant, and I mean, maybe it's usually grant open-ended authority to settle a multi-million dollar case. Typically in other states, the state system sort of ignores this problem. Do you have any comments, Re Florida? Um, I can certainly understand why they, uh, they might not off uh, or give someone open-ended authority. And so I'm wondering, I know I would look at rule 1.720 of the civil rules of procedure, rules of civil procedure. Um, I know you have to file a certificate of authority. And um, so uh, I guess I would look at that rule to see if I have complied with that. And I'm looking at it right now. Provision E, uh, 10 days prior to appearing at the mediation, they file with the court, serve on everyone, written notice, um, confirming that they have authority. You know, uh, authority doesn't say anything about uh, having unlimited authority, right? So as long as you have authority, I think you might be all right. There's also some case law on authority that you might want to look at. Kimberly, um, do you have any wisdom on that that you'd like to share? Well, um, certainly not in the multi-million dollar cases, um, but we see in small claims um, routinely um, in practice that representatives who come from debt at uh, debit cases often have to make a phone call to get, you know, permission from someone to do that. And although that's not contemplated by the rules, if agreed to by all the parties present, there's nothing, nothing precluding 
uh, the participants from um, making those types of actions. So um, I would imagine, and you know, just a reminder too that um, in for mediation, appearance um, is the is the standard of requirement for the parties, not settlement. Um, but we could certainly see that concern and appreciate that question. So um, moving down. Um, so we have a, another question here, a uh, good one. If a mediation agreement is not filed with the court, how can it be enforced? Well, uh, once you want it enforced, I think you would have to file it. Um, you like, I mean, just logistically, uh, the court can't enforce something that they haven't seen. So um, I'm assuming that in higher level circuit cases, when the parties agree to keep something confidential. That is until they want it enforced. Right. Okay. We have an, another question. Does rule 1.730A require a waiver of confidentiality by the parties in order for the mediator to put in the report that bracketed name issues, if resolved, might prompt a settlement? If so, how is the waiver placed in the record in order to protect the mediator? Well, and I guess I hadn't labeled it a waiver, but uh, the consent, and you put it in the agreement. I would put a paragraph in the agreement about whatever it is the parties are consenting to uh, the mediator, including in the report. And that way they are signing an agreement. Let's say they don't reach an agreement. Um, uh, you could, well, I guess practically, you're kind of act asking a best practices question. You could uh, put a paragraph on your report and have the parties sign the report. Um, as as far as because if they haven't reached an agreement, they uh, they don't have an agreement to sign unless you want to write up a, a, a short agreement that just lists their consent about what they want in the report. Okay. I would get their signature on whatever they're consenting to. Right. I uh, uh, good advice, Susan. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, here's one. Is it okay if a corporate or insurance representative makes a phone call to a supervisor to get full authority? Well, we know that that happens. And, um, you know, uh, actually when they call that person, if the mediator, let's say it's in caucus and, um, you know, if the mediator is not in the room in caucus, the mediator would have no way of knowing that they do that. If the mediator is in the room, I believe that our best practice recommendation would be that um, the opening statement has to be given to anybody you're including as a mediation participant, even if it's the short version under rule 10.40 of the rules for certified and court appointed mediators. And of course, anyone who becomes a mediation participant, really the other party should be consenting to that person's participation. Um, it would seem uh, you know, in the best interests of the other party to agree to that participation uh, because that's how cases get settled. Okay, great. And Susan, with that, we are coming up on the, the close of our one hour presentation. Um, um, I'd like to thank everyone for your participation. If, a reminder, if we have not answered um, your question, we will outreach to you. And if we need to send you the materials, we will do that. Uh, book January 29th for our next presentation at 12 noon. Um, and I know that I'd like to wish everybody a, a warm, healthy, and happy holiday season. Me too. Right. We at the Dispute Resolution Center 
appreciate what you do in the trial courts and we will see you next year. Yes, thank you for attending. Thank you. Have a great day.